Interesting man. He was born in Connecticut, in uh, California, I believe. And unlike the other Bones uh, characters that were in that class, friends of my father's, uh, he had not been to prep school, one of the fancy prep schools on the East Coast. He, he went to public school in California, which I do believe they must have had extremely good public schools back then because Chuck Spofford was quite a scholar and he was a, a very good musician. And uh, very high up he became after World War II, which he served in in Europe, uh, as a lieutenant or something, after he got out, he was promoted way high up to a, one of the top positions in NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, and went on to be very influential in diplomatic circles. Uh, this is coming from being a boy in the public school system uh, in California, uh, rising to just really the highest heights imaginable. So that's Chuck. The other members that are list are shown there are... Uh, Close friends of my father's, Rebel McCallum and uh, Fred Haynes, I think. I'm not going to tell you where they all are. My father is in the picture somewhere there in the second row, I think. And Edwin Blair, who uh, was called Mr. Yale always because he, uh, his, uh, he uh, was a great fundraiser for Yale. And so he was Mr. Yale. He was also the uh, gentleman that... Uh, Invited my dad to go out to Bohemian Grove for uh, one week or whatever it was. Uh, that It was through Edwin Blair that my father did go out there. And he, when he returned, you know, he, uh, he wasn't terribly impressed with what was going on there. He said the food was excellent, the lectures were pretty good, uh, everything was done very nicely. But he would never go back. Uh, so I'm making excuses for my dad because I don't think he was ever really... Um, very happy with the agenda, the Yale agenda, the orders agenda. Although he stayed close to his friends, as you can see in this picture, they're all having a very good time on someone's boat or on the dock somewhere. This is the Skull and Bones grandfather clock. These clocks were given to members of the order when they got married. And my father uh, was married in 1927, I believe, and uh, he, he ordered the clock from a clockmaker in South Carolina, and the, I think that the order paid, pays for the clock. And uh, it was a gift, and all of them receive a, a clock when they get married. I believe that's the case. And uh, we had it in our house from the time I was born, of course. And I remember it best because it's so mellow. And I would, as a young child, you know, waiting for Santa Claus to arrive, go to bed at night and the clock would, you know, go off at every hour. And my mom and dad, of course, were putting things under the tree and giving Santa Claus his, his peanut butter sandwich and banana. And I was sleeping and listening to the clock. And then finally around, you know, five, it would strike five, then six. And I'd know, well, I, am, I can get up now. And I'd run down, and Santa Claus had been there, and the sandwich had been eaten, and the clock would strike 6.30, and then everybody would have to come down and deal with me. So I, I just have great memories of the clock and what, what the significance is with the clock. Uh, Dad used to always say, he was very firm about that. He never told us why, but don't ever let the clock wind down. Keep the clock wound, Char. And uh, always keep it five minutes ahead. And what that means, maybe it means they're five minutes ahead of everybody. The order has to keep five minutes ahead of all of us. Uh, and don't let it wind down, because if you did that, they'd be getting five or ten minutes behind or more. And as a member of the family, you're, you never talk about the order. My father never discussed anything about, about the order of any significance, really. Uh, although, as, as we said earlier on, he very, most of his friends were very close. Uh, the very close friends were the order, and all of them, all the ushers in his wedding, were skull and bones. Uh, the order, and friends all the way through life. Uh, but that had nothing to do with his own personal beliefs and all. He, he, he did not, uh, he was not involved in any major 
um, political decisions affecting our country or our schools or anything. He was a wonderful mayor of several towns, a very strict constitutionalist, which certainly doesn't go along with what the order stands for. I mean, he would really cause trouble on the board if anybody deviated from the Constitution. So that's just a little bit of a defense of, of a member of the order, my dad. And uh, as you heard earlier on, you know, before he died, he, he did say that uh, he would help me if he could, if he had longer arrived. So uh, hopefully there are more members who've come to that conclusion. And maybe someday we won't have a problem with the order. I hope that the order doesn't continue causing all of us the problems that it's caused in the past, though, especially in education. Now, uh, we're going to get into the books. The books are... Books were originally... They'd never published the list of members in book form before. At least that's what my father told me. One day when he was ill, this is the catalog of the membership of living members, volume one, I think it's around 1978, This, the date on this. Well, that one's 1977, let's take a look at this. Uh, oh no, see this is October 1983. This is what happened, a dad I was taking care of my father. He was dying of cancer in New Jersey, and my sister and I would rotate, go down there. We didn't want to put him in a nursing home. So uh, one day, it was pretty close to the end of his life, uh, the mail brought these two books in the mail, which are, one is this one, volume one, The Living Members, the catalog of the living members as of 1983. And this is the catalog of all the members as of May 1977. This is the living and the dead. As of May 1977. So this is really the updated one right here. Anyway, I was opening the mail because my father wasn't well. I was taking care of all the business things, and uh, mail correspondence, and, and these arrived. And so I took them into Dad, and he said, Goy, he said, they're getting pretty fancy up there in New Haven. You know, he said, what are they doing? Uh, never been in book form before. And that was his little comment. And so I said, well, it, it is, you know, so... Uh, we, uh, around that time, I was working with Anthony Sutton on something because I was always very interested in U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union. And he was, had done such remarkable work, aside from his great book, which came out subsequently on the order. But his work at the Hoover Institute uh, in regard to United States uh, transfer of technology and all sorts of uh, information uh, and money, etc., to the Soviet Union from the time of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. And so Sutton was very highly respected in that field. And, and he, he told me, we, it just was a fluke, really, that he happened to call right at the time when the books had arrived because he said he couldn't understand what it was all about. And I said, well... You may be interested, I think, you know, in, in the order at Yale. And uh, he said, I am. He, he said, I am interested in that. He said, I, I don't understand the connection. And I, I told him that I had the list in book form. And he said, you do? And I said, yeah. And he said, would you um, mind lending them to me? And he said, I'll get them right back to you, I promise. And I believed him. And... I sent them, and he did get them back, and he called me, and he said, uh, Charlotte, with all the research I've done through the years on U.S. aid to the Soviet Union and every imaginable aspect, once I got these lists copied, he went to a copying place to get, get it done. He must have done a pretty good job because they're still in good shape. Uh, I put them down on the dining room table, and I looked, and all of a sudden, I knew I, I had found what I was looking for. I'd found the names of the people involved in 
and the foreign, foreign affairs of the United States, especially in the transfer of uh, secrets and weapons, etc., and nuclear stuff uh, to the Soviet Union and uh, banking as, as well as banking. And he said, it, and he also mentioned Hitler. He said, I saw the movers and the shakers, and it became very clear to me that this one organization was, if not totally responsible, almost all, 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 all completely, you know, really up there in responsibility for American foreign policy and economic policy. And so, and then subsequently, uh, we found out education policy. I didn't know that uh, at that time that Sutton was that deep into do doing the research on education. I think he did the best job on education research of anybody I can possibly think of uh, using, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, the, the incredible research done by, uh, in the Leipzig Connection by Lance Leone, the Leipzig Connection. I'll show you a picture of that book later. Sutton used that. I used it. And uh, anyway, that is the history of these little, these little black books, which he returned to me. And he was a very great gentleman. He, he said, I, I really didn't ask him to keep my name private, but uh, he decided on his own uh, not to let anybody know uh, where he got them from. And evidently, when, uh, after my father died, uh, he... he uh, he did, I guess, tell somebody, or maybe he didn't ever tell anybody. I, well, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I told people I didn't really care, you know. But I do want to point out right here, at the end of my father's uh, illness, when he, before he died, because he had heard me discussing foreign affairs and, and education, especially with Phyllis Schlafly, who was putting together the book uh, Child Abuse in the Classroom, which is a great book for parents out there watching if they want to really find out all about all truly do, you know, documented programs that were used in the schools between 1965 and 1985 when we had the Protection of People's Rights Amendment hearings. The, the documentation is in that book, Child Abuse in the Classroom, which is at americandeception.com a marvelous book and Phyllis and I at this time when I was taking care of my dad in 1984 were talking on the phone constantly about what was going on with global education uh, all the horrible values destroying programs role playing psychodrama you the worst stuff death education survival games where the kids have to decide who's going to be uh, allowed in the lifeboat and who isn't, depending on what your category is in life. Uh, this stuff, my father was listening from the other room because we had, we had him downstairs in a room next to the kitchen so we could take care of him. And so he must have had some, I mean, I think I brainwashed him. <laughs> I think I brainwashed my father at the end of his life because a week before he died, he looked at me. First of all, I said, did he want to read the New York Times? He was not, he really was at the point where he didn't read much. And he did see, he, I, I gave it to him and he just threw it on the floor. He was lying in bed. He threw it on the floor and he said, you know, if I had more time, I'd help you. So that was uh, really wonderful, you know, that uh, at least I feel at the end of his life, uh, he, at least he understood his daughter. <laughs> that was nice to know. Um, he was to say to me, Char, you're a very good writer, but I don't know whether I like what you write about. And I thought, well, that's, that's a compliment from you. You're a good writer, too, and a speaker. He was always a very fine speaker. But uh, I thought, okay, I've come a long ways. He thought I was a good writer, but didn't like what I was writing about or what I was saying. And then finally he said, you know, if he had more time, he'd help me. So that, so you can say that with, I'm not making excuses for Skull and Bones members, but you could say that a good percentage of each class is really quite innocuous, even though they may still go to the island, you know, where they have the, the camping and all that, and Dad did that, and even though they may be bound to vote for the, the uh, Skull and Bones candidate, like my father always voted for Bush, and my mother was a Southern conservative who would vote for... Barry Goldwater or make a mistake like I did and vote for Reagan.